Welcome to the Spotlight. My name is Yoba Selinda. The Spotlight is a TV program on personalities who have distinguished themselves in their various professional endeavors. We have an interesting edition for you today. Hope you are getting ready for some good time. Let's kick off today's edition with the word of the day. Forgiveness. What do you know about forgiveness? Julie, Ken, Ovia have something to say about the topic. But before then, let's go for a commercial break. We'll be right back. Welcome to Wisdom for Living. I am Pastor Julie Ken of here. Today I'll be talking to you also on benefits of forgiveness. And I'll take my text from Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. It says, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. So we live in a world where we give offense and we take offense. It's a natural phenomenon of mankind to offend and to be offended. And so when that one comes up, we discover that we are unable to let go of the hurt that we have felt. And so we just hold on to these thoughts in our hearts and possibly even our actions. And so God says that in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 verse 12, Jesus teaching us how to pray. He said we should say, Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, for us to get the forgiveness from God, we have to forgive. That means that our own forgiveness is tied to our ability to forgive others. Before I go uh, on to telling us the benefit of forgiveness, I would like us to realize some of the persons that we have to forgive. You have to forgive yourself. A lot of us have done some things and we just cannot forgive ourselves. If you cannot forgive yourself, it's in a very terrible state to be. That is what leads to suicide. I believe you must have heard of people killing themselves, committing suicide. It's because they couldn't forgive themselves. It could be because of a broken relationship. You just knew that you were the one that was at fault. Or you did an abortion, maybe when you were a teenage girl, or maybe just recently, and you just cannot forgive yourself. Or possibly you have, you, your mistake uh, led to the loss of a loved one, possibly a child. And you felt that if you had acted properly, that you have acted which you have acted, maybe that child would have gone. So you are now filled with this body, you just cannot let yourself go. Or you just felt that you are in a relationship or you were in a relationship and you gave yourself out so cheaply and at the end of the day the person just abandons you. And so what will happen? You just live with that guilt. You just cannot let yourself go. You can't forgive yourself. I want to tell you please forgive yourself. We also have people that their parents have offended. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 it says, fathers exasperate not their children, but rather bring them up in the training of the Lord, in the instructions and the trainings of the Lord. A lot of fathers have offended their children. A lot of fathers, they were the ones that had carnal knowledge of their girls. A lot of fathers have done atrocities, and here this girl cannot just let go. What about the mothers? They are not exempted. Because we have seen situations whereby the mothers have been responsible for the breakup of their daughter's marriage. And, or maybe somebody comes for the girl's hand in marriage and the mother just feels that the person doesn't have enough money and made the girl to lose the love of her life. And now the girl cannot forgive the mother. We also have people too that it could be your siblings. You live with an elder brother or an elder sister somebody is, is born of same parents to you, or even your uncles and all that, and they mistreated you, they maltreated you, and you just have this pain in your heart. You just cannot let go. It is high time to live a life and allow them to go. You just have to forgive. Another thing again, when you forgive, you'll be free from bitterness. You'll be free from bitterness. Bitterness is a self-inflicted poison. I believe I'll be talking on that soon. Bitterness. You see, when you forgive, there's this joy that comes to your heart. The first person that experiences the joy of forgiveness is the person that actually forgives. Because for the first time, you become whole again. For the first time, your heart is devoid of pains and sorrows. Why? Because you have just let go. 
Another thing again, one benefit to forgiveness, you are free to live again. You see, some people are not living. Because of the past hurt, they keep transferring it. They keep transferring You are not living. But when you forgive, you know what happened to you? You are free to live again. To live again means to start afresh. There's a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance, just like that. God is a God of many chances. It's not a God of second chance only. He's a God of many chances. You know why? The word of the Lord said that the blessings of the Lord, the faithfulness of the Lord, they are new every morning. So it's not about second or third or fourth. As far as you wake up every day, you are seeing the faithfulness of God. So you are free to live again. It could have been that somebody hurts you. It could have been that it's your mother, it's your father. Just forgive them. Because when you forgive them, you are liberating yourself. You are free to live another life. You are free to start again. You are free to make correction. You are free to make restitution. You are free to have a better life. That is the benefit of forgiveness. And I'll leave this word with you. Sometimes we forgive people, not because they are sorry for what they have done. Because sometimes you have this mind that if they come to me and say, I am sorry, I'll forgive them. But sometimes people don't even say they are sorry. They don't know that they've offended you. Jesus said something when he was on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And Stephen, when he was being uh, uh, stoned, he said, Father, forgive these people. So sometimes you just have to let go of people, even if they don't ask you for forgiveness. Because they are still children. And let me say something about that. When you forgive them, don't bother about whether they come to ask you for forgiveness. If they ask you for forgiveness, it's all right. But if they don't, forgive them first so that you can move forward. God bless you in Jesus' name. Wow. That's a great presentation by Julie Ken Ovia. We should learn how to forgive. You cannot be forgiving if you don't learn how to forgive others. Thank you very much, Julie Ken Ovia, for that great presentation. After the break, an interview with a man who organizes a program popularly called ZAM, Jehovah ZAM, Most Reverend Job N. Chukun, the priest in charge of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, Abakaliki, Ebony State. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Um, Reverend Job, you are welcome to the show. Thank you. Please, Reverend, can you tell us about yourself? Okay. My name is Most Reverend Job and Chuku. Uh, the minister in charge of Aziyoku Model Parish. This very parish. This is our center, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, as you. So, uh, I'm a worker in the Presbyterian Church of Nigeria for so many years now. So, uh, I have been going from, I mean, I have taught many parts of this country doing the work of God. So, since 2015, I'm here. That's quite interesting. Yeah. Okay, sir. Tell us the program Zam Jehovah Zam. How did it start? And how it has been able to come to life? Okay. The program Zam Jehovah Zam is Igbo language. Sam Jehovah Sam, that is, answer me, God, answer me, oh God, answer me. And that is, when somebody is in difficulty, and you are looking for help, and you are looking for how to get about it, and you are looking for answers to your problems, so that is how Zam Jehovah Zam started. Uh, in fact, it is can be seen in the Bible. Uh, First Kings chapter 18. In fact, verse 37 precise is uh, where 
there was a problem of worship. The God to be worshipped. And then uh, Elijah was on the picture at that very time. Elijah is a man of prayer, a prophet, a man of prayer. And then we had the, uh, him as the prophet representing the people. And then we have the prophets of Baal. There were so many worshipping Baal. And then the king at that time, Ahab, uh, was weighing very high in the society. And then he, he was intimidating those who are worshipping the living God. That is why Elijah told them what to do, to sacrifice for God. And then let their own God come and answer, and let his own God, let us know the, which God is a living God. God. Yes, that is what happened. And uh, when they have tried their best, the prophets of uh, Baal tried their best, they could not succeed. Then Elijah called on God, the living God. And then that is, he was telling God, Zam Ekwere, Jehovah, Zam Ekwere. If you read that passage, you discover that uh, God answered him, the living God answered the prayer. And that made the people to change from their idol worship and come to the living God. That is how it came about. Now, people discover that when you call on God, God will answer you. Particularly in time of trouble, God will answer you. So that is how Zam Jehovah Zam started. How have you been able to sustain the program Zam Jehovah Zam all these years, considering the challenges? Yeah, the, it is God who does his work. It's God who does his work. Whenever uh, this program started here in 2006 by Reverend Edwin Mancho, he started it. When people were yearning, looking for God to answer their prayers because of the challenges, enormous challenges in the society. So, uh, he started it and uh, it involved not only this church that started it, okay. but even the churches around all were involved. And so uh, he started it that time. And whenever a call is placed that we want to have Zam Jehovah Zam, because it's once every year, okay. and we normally have it in the month of May every year. So whenever he uh, sensitized people, telling them that we are going to have Zam Jehovah Zam, you see interest of people. God will raise individuals who come and support us and help us when we are organizing it. That is how the thing goes. And you see that the interest is becoming more and more. People who, whenever we are organizing it, people will be coming from different churches. In fact, right from here to Yiku, people come for this very program. All the areas in Abakleg and all the churches, they are interested in Zam, Jehovah, Zam. In this program, sir, do you have any challenges in hosting the program? There is no, nothing that you will be doing uh, in this world that you will not have both pros and the cons. Yes. Uh, like when we want to do it, actually individual support, but many times it will not be enough. Uh -huh. There are times we will do want to go to the air, on the air. We will not have the enough fund that will take us to the, uh, on the air, uh -huh. so that uh, the TV and uh, this thing uh, would have been booming it, but because there is no money, there is no enough fund to sustain it. So 
That is one of the challenges. We don't have enough funds to do it. And we don't organize it because we want money to raise, not that we don't need money, but we don't request people to give us money to pray for them. So the challenges is that we don't have enough resources to, to do it the way it is in our minds. So it's one of the challenges that we normally have. Then another challenges that we have is that there are so many people that are willing to come, but because of distance, they cannot come. And we don't have uh, something like bus uh, that will be carrying people from different places to attend. So these are the challenges. Because had it been that we have something like bus uh, that will be helping us, so that uh, during the time we are having it, we normally have the program for 21 days. Uh -huh. And within this period, we needed a vehicle that would be carrying people to this venue and then take them back after the program. But uh, these are challenges that uh, if God will help us raise people who can give us bus, like the present government, I think the, go uh, the present government is doing a lot, but uh, we still need their support because whenever we're having this program, um, it helps the young people, the, all the young people, they would like to be here, every, every one of them, instead of going and moving around, along the street just like that, then they will come and attend spiritual program. It is a spiritual program that uh, people feel at ease that when they go there, God will help them. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us. Thank you. Welcome back. Consistency is what we need to learn. In everything you do in life, you have to be consistent for you to record success. Thank you very much, Reverend Job and Chubu. Coming up after the break is a story of a man who lost his mother at a very tender age, but vowed to succeed in life. He finally became a medical doctor, and now he is the chairman of Nigeria Medical Association, Abakalike Branch, Dr. John Egede. Stay tuned. My name is Dr. John I am the chairman of the German Medical Association of the State Branch. I'm also a consultant, obstetrician gynecologist in the Federal Teaching Hospital at Bacaliki, or oh, SY Federal Teaching Hospital at Bacaliki. Now I'm um, Alex Akbele Federal University Teaching Hospital at Bacaliki. Oh, well, um, I believe it's just a calling. You know, the days is born in secondary school, but from primary school, I, I didn't know about science. We of us were attended a very remote set of primary schools. Um, but something struck me in primary school. I told myself I'm going to study sciences. I'm going to secondary school to, uh, to study sciences. And then, then all my brothers were in business and things like that. And so um, we went to secondary school. I attended social science school in Bank. And uh, while the, um, one, one thing led to the other, I was still discussing about the different um, uh, professions and all that. Yeah, and then uh, it came to my mind, yeah, and it would be good if I become a doctor. Particularly when you see people suffering and then you know, look at it, I can help this person, you know, by with my knowledge. So it, it, when you remember such things, you know, it will give some kind of moral to you to, you know, to study medicine. So that was the situation I found myself then in secondary school. And then we, one kept making efforts and then until um, we found ourselves in the university studying medicine and by the grace of God we graduated. And then after the graduation one looked at it and said, uh, well during internship you have your rotations, you go through all different um, rotations and all that. And then during that period also one thing, another thing, where do I think I fit the most? And um, I personally, I felt um, that helping women is the best. Um, 
partly because of something that happened in my life. Um, my mother died very early, quite, quite, quite early. Uh, this is a few weeks or maybe a minute I was born and all that. And I felt that um, having been a doctor is good to help women to live. So I think that's one of the things that made me begin to think about um, specializing in obstetrics and gynecology. So um, that's a brief um, summary of um, why I chose to study medicine, uh, to help people and then to study, um, uh, to become a gynecologist, you know, to help women to live. And it has, been, it has always been my, uh, my intention, my hope, I wanted to lead people. Leadership, I believe everybody has one, um, and I somehow at some point I've always, from medical school, I've always found myself in medical policy, the medical system politics, and um, from there, um, in the university, in, um, in, when I did my internship and when I became a doctor, um, I've always found myself in one way, in one doctor's politics or the other, not as a chairman or as a president. I've held several other positions, including financial secretary, treasurer, association of resident doctors. And then, and two years ago, I was elected as a chairman of the Abakaliki Zoom a chairman. And as chairman of Abakaliki Zoom, like of NNN. And then, um, from there, the people saw the little work we were able to do based on the limited resources that was available to us. And then they called me and I said, I think you will do well as a state chairman of NME. So I thought to offer it. I said, well, it's a good opportunity for me to come and serve my people. So um, we now went into it, and by the grace of God, on, um, the election was held on um, uh, July 14, 2018. And by his grace, I won, and here I am today serving the people, serving doctors in the police state. And number one, uh, yeah, one, number one leader. Doctors in the state. Uh, it has not really been easy to combine both um, both jobs. Uh, but what we do is um, we try to attend to as much as we can, attend to all of them as much as we can. Because of course, um, first I am a doctor, so I must attend to my patient first uh, before I think about um, um, doctor's politics. Um, but if I have something that's pressing about doctors, of course, also I have other people who are helping me in the unit. I have. In, my, in every, I mean, as a consultant, I have people under me, I have senior registrars, registrars, and um, uh, house officers as interns, and then um, the medical students. They all work in my unit, and I have other colleagues as consultants in the same unit. So we all share functions, and by their efforts, also, it has made it easy for me to be able to combine my clinical duties as a consultant, and then also my job as the chairman of the Nigerian Medical Association. So in some way, that's not been easy. But what we do is that we um, we look at where the work duty calls the most at that material, the time, and then we attack it. We scale up whatever thing we're supposed to do. And what I, I also do is that anything I want to do, I do it quickly because of something I learned um, sometime in the university. Uh, anything you want to do, do it quickly. Never defer whatever you can do in the morning to evening. So whatever that I need to do, I do it immediately. Because if you don't do that, you know, over the days, over the hours, you see that you, the amount of job you have to do begin to pile up. So whatever I need to do, I crush it at that moment and then move on to another thing. So those are some of the, um, the things I will have put in place to be able to, you know, hold both positions. Yes, what yes, what yes, um for instance, um, we normally right for instance to the government to give us any assistance they can. Um, some of those assistants include to use their facility for the outreach. That's I mean the health facility, maybe a primary health center, maybe a general hospital. So government sometimes provides those facilities in you know, an enabling environment for us to be able to carry out the medical outreach. The other thing we do also and we also write the government to provide us things like um, bed nets, um anti malaria and so on. Um, screening, like HIV screening tests and things like that. So those are the areas that government come in sometimes. They also involve some pharmaceutical companies and all that who may wish to develop drugs for us and all that. So, and then apart from that, then they may will provide, some also sometimes buy the, most of the drugs, provide the manpower, and then the other logistics for such programs. Sometimes 
Sometime last year, was a partner with the Bible, you know, to uh, conduct such medical outreach. So government is most of most often is fully involved in terms of providing the facility, in terms of providing some um, uh, some equipment like um, like the drugs or um, screening tests, screening um, tests, um, like HIV screening tests and diabetes piece of juice or malaria you know, screening tests. And then also, government uh, is involved in providing business and things like that. So those are the things that government do for us when we carry out medical outreach. And if they have money, of course, they can also support us with money. Success is not made for some set of people. It's for everybody. If only you can pay the price. Thank you very much, Dr. John Enkede. I hope you've been motivated and inspired by this program. This is where we'll draw the curtain of today's edition. For sponsorship and advert placement, or if you have any story, brand or services you want us to talk about, please feel free to call us on the following numbers. 080-33-269843 or 080-37-667862. You can follow us on our social media platform on the spotlight. Team, we come your way again next week. Same time, same station. I remain your host, Obaselinda. Bye for now.